we have Shanta Gokhale today who is having a second Mumbai local session with us. Shanta ji, thank you so much for having me. And uh, so, um, Shanta ji is basically an editor. Uh, She'll talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to clap for Edgar because he's extremely nervous about public speaking yeah. and he's doing an excellent job. Yeah. Yeah. Shanta is a bilingual writer, an editor, and a critic as well. And yeah, she's going to talk about shaping a story and how and what's the experience of being an editor. Shanta over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Shanta I'll just quickly take two minutes. I'll just put the screen down. Sure, so in sure. case if there's more. Yeah, problem. yeah. Yes. So we can squeeze more people in. Where's that glorious image of Charlton Heston? Where you want to show that? No. I'm missing him. <laughs> He's, he he uh, lifts my talk. And because you then. I, huh? You want, you want to put up uh, no, I have him in my mind. Okay. <laughs> Reason why I was talking about this image, um, which these people asked me to provide to illustrate what editing meant. And um, I was lost because editing is very much a behind the scenes thing. It is not glamorous. Uh, it, it, it doesn't create stars. It's just something that is done quietly without uh, a do. So an image. The idea of an image to illustrate editing um, kind of knocked me if you want for to a while. Huh? Uh, just let them see okay. it once. Okay. So can you, I can pass that for a few minutes. This is. This is Charlton Heston playing Michelangelo carving. This is a book that uh, I read when I was sixteen and the idea of <coughs> a block of marble suggesting the figure inside so that you chip away the marble till you arrive at the figure that you've imagined. This is the parallel I saw between sculpting and editing because editing in fact is sculpting a book out of the given material. Film editing of course is also the same that you sculpt a film out of a whole lot of footage. So editing of all kinds is this kind of carving it um, there are lots of people who've asked me uh, since this uh, notice appeared in Mumbai Mirror, what will you say about editing? What's it all about? I said, yeah, <laughs> that is the question I'm going to try and answer. Um, people have heard of newspaper editors. Uh, those are the most publicly known editors and such. And uh, th the newspaper editor is the one who will decide on uh, newspaper uh, policy, what kinds of news goes into his paper, what kind of news is placed where. But not the nitty gritty. It is an overall vision of what the paper should be. That's 
one kind of editing. And uh, I have actually uh, not been a newspaper editor. I have edited books. I have three here, which I will come to one by one. But uh, as an editor, I have always seen uh, my role as, again, carving out a narrative from the given material. And by narrative, I mean something that from the moment the reader opens the book and reads the first page, there's a sense of development that from here, the next stage is an organic development, and so on and so forth, till you come to the end. And there is a whole narrative constructed, which has led the reader along. Architecture, some architects have a similar thing in their building. They have a path. So when you enter, there's only one way in which you can see the building. The architect leads you down that path. And as you walk, maybe you see a couple of trees. And that is intended. You take a turn, and you see two big windows. And that is intended. You're meant to see it. So at the end of that walk, you have a kind of full experience of the building and its spaces. So this, this path from beginning to end builds up the story. Now, uh, nobody who is in standard two and is asked by parents, yes, sir, what will you be? No one says, editor, <laughs> because nobody knows what editing is. Uh, so I would like to begin by telling you how I got into this. Uh, that's my story. Years ago, I was married into the Navy. I was wife of Vijay Kumar Mohan Shahani, father of my children, Deruka and Girish Shahani. I spent nine years in the Navy, in the war. <coughs> in my fourth year, we were transferred to Vishakhapatna. And it was a very, very dynamic uh, vice admiral there. Vice admiral Krishnan, who was commander in chief of the Eastern Naval Command. And uh, he collared me uh, at a party one day and said, uh, I believe you're right. So, I didn't know whether that was an accusation or what, so I sort of said, uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> so he said, I have an idea for you. Yeah. I have for a long time wanted to start a newsletter. I have a name for it. It will be called Eastern Naval News. And I was looking for someone who could edit this. And I said, you're looking at me? So he said, you're the obvious choice, because you're a writer. I said, that's different from being an editor. I have never in my life edited anything. And I really, really don't know the first thing about it. He said, he, you learn. We all learn this way. There's always a first time. So I shall send you 
some material, look at it, and see what you can do. And my launching date is decided, which was just one month from when we were talking. And uh, I hope I shall have Eastern Naval News in hand five days before. So I had my schedule worked out. And I looked at this uh, fat file, which had a whole lot of news items very much to do with the Navy. And uh, just briefly, let me tell you that in the Navy, there were two groups of people. One group was male, and the other group was female. The males had names, and the females were W stroke O male. <laughs> so there was no individual identity at all. And when the uh, W stroke O's wished to participate in the conversation going on at the bar, because it was always much more exciting. They were talking politics, they were talking uh, sociology, all sorts of things. So when you walked across, they, their, their faces split into smiles, and they said, so how expensive do you think tomatoes are? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, would, I would say, well, I haven't shopped in the longest time. <laughs> and when I do, I tend not to ask the vegetable seller what he is charging me because it takes too much time to haggle. So I just buy and give. That's it. So I don't know. But the whole idea being that W stroke O was uh, the person you talked to about vegetables, about children, and about the IR problem. Do you have them? Don't you have them? Are they good or are they terrible? Whatever. So I, this was something else. I was being addressed as an individual. And I thought that was a good start. And I had to prove myself. So there was all this stuff. And uh, it gave me wonderful insights into the workings of the Navy, for which I was extremely <coughs> grateful. But I thought, all this stuff cannot make a newsletter, because instantly there's Admiral Krishnan, there's me, there's a newsletter, there's a reader. So this thing is supposed to keep that person interested. <laughs> this thing has to grab that person's attention and stop him or her from picking it up and putting it into the WPP. So to that end, I thought, OK, Navy is not just all this stuff. Navy is a whole lot of wonderful stories, sometimes rather sad stories of uh, wives who are qualified and because of transfers don't have jobs, can't do jobs. But wives who are artists, we had Anjali Ila Menon staying in Vaisag, and uh, one would spend days watching her pain. So she could be, uh, one could profile her in. So, so suddenly ideas began ticking in my mind, and I created the first Eastern Naval News. And uh, Admiral Krishnan was. Maha, please. He said that. I told you we could. <laughs> <laughs> One second. Guys, I'm so sorry. I know we're <coughs> If everybody just moves up once and then he leaves four spaces in the back, then you will not be disturbed so often. Right? Yeah. Eight people, 
would like to go up and see how comfortable they are sitting. You are not as comfortable as them. So as people from the you can join them. <laughs> but please, can we not leave the high space, please? Yeah? And if, uh, maybe a little bit this side, if you don't mind. Yeah? Because then one more person can move up here in front. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, fantastic. Excellent. Let's surround Shanta nicely. <laughs> She'll feel nice and loved and embraced. Yeah? Can I have you move up here? I'm going to be a pain. I'm sorry. I'm going to remove all spaces that I see. Yeah? Great. So now we have at least three people who can sit. And if somebody comes here, fantastic. Yeah? Okay. So you have three more spaces to manage. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So I had uh, suddenly discovered a skill. It, uh, I couldn't call it a skill just then. It was only the beating. And I was going to be uh, more acutely tested as I went on. My next uh, uh, experience of editing came in uh, Femina. I was a sub-editor there. And uh, I was an emergency appointment because someone had just walked out. And their entire portfolio had to be handled. And I, was, I joined at that time. And that portfolio was gratefully put into my lap. And everyone washed their hands off it and did their own work. So what I inherited was a bulging file that high of short stories. And to balance that, I had a bulging file of recipes. <laughs> so I was in charge of the cookery page and the fiction page. I had to give both pages a certain character. Because unless I did that, unless what I thought cookery should be, unless that got reflected, anyone else might as well do that page. So it, it was important for that to happen. But I was completely for, floored by the volume of what was there. And why was it there? Why? Because not for the last two years had my disgruntled predecessor, who had always wanted to walk out, dealt with it. All these stories had arrived and not been read. All these recipes had arrived and not been sifted through. So uh, my first job, which was not an editorial job at all, was to sift through these things. And the first next short story that came, I wrote a polite note saying, I'm returning this to you as is without opening the envelope. Because I already have six months worth of short stories on my file. And please, 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 send me exactly this story in this envelope six months from hence, and I shall read it and get back. So the next six months was spent going through these files, rejecting, accepting, using, till they were down to a reasonable size. And then the new things started coming in. At which point, uh, though I couldn't do much with the cookery pages, and those were just things which one carried on with, but fiction was my thing. And <laughs> I, I had to, in some way, get in stories <coughs> that mattered to me. So what it meant was writing of dozens of letters to writers whom I admired, always beginning, dear so-and-so, I know we are a women's magazine, but we do wish to 
to use really worthwhile fiction and untrain yourself. And please send a story. No editor of a magazine or newspaper ever begs you are like this. You are supposed to look at things that come, delicately pick them up, and usually drop them into the waste paper basket. <laughs> because uh, you don't have the time for that sort of thing. But here was I putting myself out, being most uneditorial like, and inviting stories. And soon enough, I thought, OK, I don't mind reading Penna now. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my second stint of editing. Third stint happened in Glaxo Laboratories, where I joined because Times of India, there was a lockout. And I needed a job. And Glaxo wanted someone in their public relations department. So they had a house magazine called Glaxo News. And I saw the uh, earlier numbers. And it was like some uh, tied uh, manager sitting fatly in his seat and being <coughs> interviewed and always being asked very polite questions and no hard questions at all. And uh, the Black Sun News was full of that sort of thing. So as I said, editor or whatever you call me, I want to be interested in reading what I'm putting out. So by and by, Glaxo, very stodgy, extremely stodgy, do not, did, never did want change. So I had to worm myself in. And I would say to my boss, um, remember you said you had that brilliant idea of interviews? Oh, did I? Yeah, of, of course. We have to do them. Okay. So you, you took that idea and then just expanded it. So I had all sorts of series happening in Glaxo News, how people grow their gardens, what people will do after they retire, and uh, lots of findings that uh, uh, when I interviewed women about what they would do after they retired, they would say, Oh my dear, what a relief is going to be to get out of this nine to five. I'll spend time with my grandchildren. I want to join a baking class. All my embroidery is left. I want to travel, all this. And you went to the men, and they said, there's always a second innings. <laughs> Don't you want to get out of all this managing business? Not really. I mean, after all the experience that I have collected, <laughs> it should be passed on. OK. <laughs> so there was that difference. And I played it up nicely in Glaxo News. So suddenly, workers were coming and saying, oh, that thing that we had you know, about uh, our boss, that was really interesting. <laughs> Good. So that was my third stint at editing. Then uh, from Glaxo, I moved back to the Times uh, as arts editor. Uh, Times had never had an arts page. It used to carry reviews, uh, quite a few of them. And they'd be put wherever there was a place. Culture is like that. Culture doesn't have a place of its own. It uh, has to fit in wherever it can. 
So that's how these reviews used to be scattered. And um, here, suddenly, the Times was giving me five columns, three times a week, all yours. Wow, I <laughs> couldn't believe this. I couldn't believe it till I found out the reason. The reason being that Times was celebrating its 150th year. And they were celebrating it with arts. Uh, I don't know how many of you, yeah, some were born, some were not. But there was a huge art exhibition in VT Station in the concourse. And some of the best artists in the land showed their work. And uh, 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 commuters, as they passed by, had the time, despite the 565 or 535, which was soon leaving, despite that, people would stand and stare. And it was a great thing. There were music, pro <coughs> music programs, all sorts of things happening. Now, if uh, an organization was showing itself to be concerned about the arts, how could it have a newspaper which didn't have any art in it at all? Which is why I had five columns to fill three times a day. And I did it with great pleasure, because when you have five columns, you can design the page. If you're given, given one column, you fill it. Five columns, you design. So it was a <coughs> tremendous opportunity <coughs> for me. And one of the things that an editor is supposed to do, not that everyone does it, but is supposed to do, is to scout for talent. I know editors who um, may read uh, a short story somewhere and say to themselves, here's an author that I want to publish. And we take the trouble, call that person up, go and visit, propose a book idea, and get that person to write. Uh, that is the job of an editor. And taking over the arts page, or beginning launching the arts page, uh, with nothing to fall back on, scouting was my primary job. How I did it is, of course, a long story. But the aim was to get uh, the present reviewers who had got into a rut of writing, uh, reviews don't appear any longer in newspapers. But the regular thing that reviewers did was, say, for a music program, um, it would be so-and-so sang. Uh, these were the ragas, A, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, uh, uh, Tons like uh, lightning. Then, uh, no, sorry, I, I've erased those phrases from my mind. But there were some cliches yeah. uh, in which reviewers talked about the art that they were viewing. And of course, people didn't really read reviews, not really. They glanced through them, and if they noticed that there was uh, a bit of criticism, they called up the editor and said, does your reviewer even understand the first things about music? Uh, and uh, when it was a review that glowed with praise, they would call and say, what a wonderful review. He is, he is so sensitive. He, 
he picks up every good thing and okay, right. So one had to deal with artists on one side and reviewers on the other. And reviewers were very old style, wrote very Victorian prose, and you had to tell them that is not what the reader today responds to. Some of them uh, got pissed off with me. And uh, they complained to the editor and said, you know, she's taking on all sorts of young people and, you know, uh, we've been here for 30 centuries and <laughs> you know, sort of uh, allowing this to happen. Uh, but luckily, uh, the editor was Darren DeMonte. And so he didn't even tell me what people were saying. And I carried on. I got a lovely bunch of young people to write. And it was a total delight to design and run this page. I also had a resident editor uh, who, the Times has some of those people, did, not anymore, who um, thought anything Indian, uh, regional, was a little infra, not to be touched. Um, I had a wonderful feature on uh, truck drivers who wrote poetry, Urdu poetry. And they had an adda somewhere in uh, Dongdi, I think. And they would gather there and recite their poetry. Imagine truck and then Urdu poetry. I, I just thought it was so fascinating. And uh, one of my contributors did a lovely story of me. Now, uh, what used to happen in those days was that we designed the page that this story about the truck drivers will take the top of the five columns. And below that, there'll be one review, one interview, whatever. So a good mix of things. Then these uh, pages were made up by the artists. And then the resident editor would take a round. And she stopped on this particular occasion at our artist desk and said, what are truck drivers doing on this page? Urdu poetry. <laughs> so my, my chief sub-editor, who was with, with the artist at the time, got so angry, he came stomping down and said, this is what she said. So I said, whatever she said, the truck drivers remain on the page. I'm in charge, and our readers will read about the truck drivers. They jolly well will. So what she says, listen, we have a proverb in Marathi. Take it in one year, let it out the other. That, that experience lasted for two and a half years. Uh, in the third year, uh, the Times had overcome the glory and the pride of being 150 years old <laughs> and uh, decided it was time to switch off the arts. And so it happened that word came, you will not publish your next art page. Um, editor is actually as responsible, or should be, to contributors as to the Maliks. And uh, having Daryl as a go-between helped, because I said, Daryl, these are things which I have commissioned. 
It's my commitment to these writers. They have written for me to my brief, and I will publish them. There is no great hurry to stop the page. It can be stopped next week. We'll do that. So I got my point. I published my last arts page and put down my editorial pen. I did not leave the Times immediately uh, because I wanted to feel powerful. <laughs> I wanted them to say, and they did say, what will you do now? <laughs> and I said, there's lots of work to be done in the Times. For instance, letters to the editor are treated so badly. No one wants to touch them. Do you know that we have a roster for letters to the editor? That the file, today it's with me, I pick the first two letters, pass the file on to someone else for the following day. I said, that's not how we treat our readers. So I shall do letters to the editor. And the letters, then all of them were read. And once again, the selection reflected what I wanted to read. Always that is the measure. You have to entertain yourself. Otherwise, you're not doing the job. So when the time came for me to decide that I wanted to walk out, it was going to be walking out. <laughs> so at my, that point, <laughs> they wanted me to stay. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, no, no, I have a book to write. I was planning this immense history of Marathi theater. And I said, so the manager said, all the assistant editors are writing their books sitting here. Why can't you do the same? <laughs> so I said, sorry, I do not do other kinds of work on other people's time and money. If you're paying me, I do your work. Otherwise, I quit. I'm going. So I walked out and wrote my first history of Marathi theater. This was me as author, not as editor at all. But as an author, I had to submit to being edited. And having edited, I was full of appreciation for what my friend Anjum Katyal did with this book. She was with Seagull Books, and they were publishing this book. And the meticulousness with which she went through the copy, asking questions, asking for clarifications, and, uh, uh, and making that book a better book than it would have been had it been the way I had done it. Also, to give it shape, the way I had envisaged it was starting with history, going on to the 60s, 70s, 80s period of theatre, which was full of uh, dynamism and experimentation, and then moving on to uh, interviews with people <coughs> who were practicing then. So it sort of had three sections to it. The editor decided how these sections were to be placed, how they were to be titled, and how <laughs> some of those things should go into appendixes and not be part of the main body of and suddenly you saw, yes, uh, 
this is done so that the reader knows what's happening where in the book. She has constructed a beautiful narrative out of what I presented to her. So uh, after that book came these three books. And these are really my uh, editorial pride. Number one, on Satyadev Dubey. Number two, on Veena Pani Chawla. And number three, on Bombay Theatre. From the 60s to the 80s, the whole experimental movement. And this is what made editing so exciting. That uh, subtitle of my uh, shaping. Uh, shaping a story. story. But the sub is about the excitement of editing. Uh, there's two kinds of um, images I have of editing. One, as I said, is you, you have a, a whole block and you're making a, a story out of it. But the other is where you have a vision of a book and you collect material and arrange it in such a way that it makes a story. So the second kind I always read is very much like um, the first kind of installation art that happened when artists lost patience with painting and putting things up on walls and decided to use space. They created what were called assemblages. So it was found objects or objects that you went out to find and you put them together and the juxtaposition of those objects created your work of art. So uh, this, this first uh, edited book on Satyadev Dubey was an assemblage. That are articles seen by other people. Yes, yes, that's right. So um, I was actually, let me just read a few lines from here because it explains exactly uh, how I approached this book. I've said in the introduction. Looking at the material that I had gathered, I came to the conclusion that the only effective and sensible way of organizing it was chronological. The material itself fell absolutely naturally into five decades of Dubey's work. The 60s when he worked in the Bhulabhai Desai uh, Institute on Warden Road. 70s when he worked in Valchan Terrace in Tarde. And end of 70s and 80s when he worked in Chabildas Hall. And then finally moved to Prithvi. So um, I realized that these were chronological phases, and I could organize this material <coughs> accordingly. But do what? What, what, how did I want to present Satyadev Dube to the reader? Yes, I wanted to write about, uh, uh, have uh, articles about his production. But he was also a prolific writer himself. He used to do absolutely uh, uh, provocative columns for the Times. 
and for other papers, in which he um, put forward his opinions on theater. So that was the uh, director himself speaking. So his, uh, some of his columns had to have a place. He was widely interviewed. I had about uh, two dozen interviews with him for me. I had to select interviews uh, so that they reflected his work during that time. So every section, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and after, held together as reflecting his work, whether it was he talking, whether it was people reviewing his plays, whether uh, it was interviews, whatever. So when you read one section, you knew this was Dubé in the 60s. This was Dubé in the 70s. Now, um, very often what happens is when, and it's very much an uh, Indian kind of thing, not to be rude to the subject or about the subject. Uh, you must always be polite. You must always say nicest things about the person. Um, of course, that is not how a book should be edited. You want to actually present a person and his work. It has to have both the good and the bad, or favorable opinions, unfavorable opinions. As it happened, uh, in the 90s, Dubé stopped doing other people's plays. And much to everybody's regret, he started writing his own. <laughs> and if I had to cover that decade of his work, I had to have material which said, what a terrible play this was. And what is Dubey doing? So I have some <laughs> brilliant reviews here. <laughs> about Dubey's later work. But it, it, is, it was important to have that. You have to have the positive and the negative. So I particularly also wrote to the sponsors uh, in Delhi, asking them to go through their files and find a few articles written about Dubey's so-called experimental work. The Delhi people and the Bombay people, they're like that. And the Delhi people love to believe that if there's any experimentation happening, it's in Delhi. And everyone else is doing the routine work. You know. Of course, uh, the Bengalis <laughs> don't, I mean, I don't know how they deal with, <laughs> with this kind of uh, Delhi pride, but certainly uh, the, the uh, Bombay people uh, know and are sensitive to this. So out of that, I picked out one article <coughs> by a professor of the National School of Town. So uh, he had the authority. He had all the authority to say what he felt. And he wrote, uh, he's written a <coughs> very good article uh, which gives you a clear picture of the virtues of a particular production. And then he goes on to say, but what was new? How can you call this new? It isn't. So uh, it was important for me to include this, to invite such a viewpoint and incorporate it into the book. So after Dubé was done, Meena Pali Chowda 
was a completely different kind of theatre director. Dubey uh, had no theories. He was a practical man. He, uh, uh, in fact, um, hated, hated the idea of theorizing. And uh, he would say, oh, I know all that stuff. I know my Stanislavski. I know my Grotowski. They have nothing to do with me. This is who I am, and this is how I work. Meenakhani Chawla was exactly the opposite. She theorized her work. She wrote extremely important papers about theatre. She worked for years on a single script, whereas Dubey's scripts were extremely verbose because he loved speaking and therefore all his characters talked a lot also. Meena Pani was the exact opposite. Her first play, Savitri, was 40 lines carved out of an epic poem of Sri Aurobindo of 24 thousand lines. And she cut it and cut it and pared it down, pared it down. And the final script was 40 lines. Because her style of theater was, again, the opposite of the ways. It was not realistic theater. It was physical theater with lots of vocal experiments physical experiments, and she didn't require so much speech. It all, her, the bodies of her actors spoke instead of uh, their mouths. She had a whole lot of activities besides just doing theater. Uh, she was an academic. She organized seminars. She conducted workshops. So when I came to writing about her, the original idea was that I would write a history of her work and a critique as well. But there was no way I thought I could include all of her work into that sort of history, because it wasn't linear, it wasn't chronological, it was all happening at the same time. And so the shape that this narrative took in my head was not a chronological line, but a multifocal kind of assemblage. And, uh, Working on this design, I got in a, a whole lot of people. So then I became what's called an, a commissioning editor, apart from then being a proper editor, because uh, to, to create the design that I had in mind, I had to invite work. <coughs> I had to uh, identify people who would give me what I thought was required to tell this story. Um, my experience, uh, rather an odd one, as always, I wanted some kind of counter-opinion to come in. A lot of the reviews were full of praise, and her work was quite amazing. But when she did something that people didn't quite like, no one wrote. No one wrote about it. But one heard that people had problems with certain plays. And this had to be stated in the book. So I got Anmol Velani, who was close to her work. But I knew that he had problems with one of her plays, the head and the tortoise. And I said, 
please interview her and put all your doubts to her. Because those doubts would reflect the doubts in the reader's mind. And they would automatically then be addressed by Pinapani. So he did this long interview. And all the uh, things that people had problems with in this play were addressed. Uh, because at the end of a production, when there's a question answer session, I, uh, Vinapani used to get very impatient with questions. And uh, I would say to her, You have taken three years <laughs> to create this script, and you've cut out a whole lot of stuff which would have explained things to your viewers. You've cut it all out. And now you won't even answer questions. Not on. You have to. But uh, at the end of a show, who wants to? OK. But this was the way in which I decided this part of it should come in. So uh, this book was very, very differently edited from Satyadev Kupe. And finally, this was a completely different kind of proposition, because this is an oral history. And uh, oral history, when you go to actors and directors and ask them one question, <laughs> You don't need to ask them anymore. They tell you the story of their life. So knowing this would happen, we had about 10 or 12 uh, journalists interviewing our interviewees. Uh, and those journalists were given very, very firm instructions. Do not encourage rambling. <laughs> Do not encourage anecdotes. We want three things from these people and try and keep them to those three things as far as possible because that is the design of our book. Why are we doing this? We are doing it because we are saying there were three spaces in Mumbai where the experimental theater happened. Why? Why those spaces? Was there something to do with those spaces? The way those spaces were designed, the way those spaces were run, did that have something to do with the quality of theater that came out of them during those years? That is important. Second thing is, please talk about people behind the scenes people who allowed these things to happen. Because unless you have a place that is run well and is open and warm and welcoming, you don't get this kind of free theater happening at all. And finally, please tell us what were the significant plays that you did or you saw during those time. So the whole book is divided into three parts, Bhula Bhai Desai, Valchan Terrace, and uh, Chabildas. And within each section, there are what I have called the anchor or the supporter, which are people who have made the space available or run the space, followed by uh, stories about those people, people working in those spaces, what did they think about these people or what were their experiences. And I had the most marvelous time juxtaposing because juxtaposition of material is the best way of creating the truth of the matter because there is one opinion there's another opinion, put them together, and a third stands up. And that is the truth. 
There's a lovely story here, for instance, about a peon in um, Gulaba Desai, who was a natural artist. He used to carve wood. And the artists who were working there encouraged him and said, wonderful, um, why don't we have a show of this? And uh, so they organized a show in Jahangir and uh, did very well. Now, after this, one of our interviewees says that this man was spoiled uh, by some Swiss woman that he married and went off with. And uh, there was another opinion, the same story, uh, in which uh, it wasn't a Swiss woman at all. Uh, I think it was a Dutch woman or whatever. <laughs> but I thought, OK, this goes up to this. So you read this, and you read that, and you know that memory is fallible. People remember the way they want to remember. Mm, yes. Yes. And throughout this oral history, mm -hmm. uh, you come up with this again and again, that uh, things are given a slant according to who is talking, who is talking to you. And uh, when you put it all together, a very clear picture emerges. So that was uh, this this uh, book. And right now, I'm uh, planning to edit a book of short stories, multilingual short stories, wow. located in Bombay. Uh, lots of them. Uh, it uh, requires translation work. Much of this did. What was written about Satyadev Dube was half in Marathi. So uh, editors are not supposed to be translators, but since I am, I did trans that was half my work, translating. So uh, that book will soon come. And I'm excited, as always. It's done, the book? Huh? It's done. No, no. We're planning it, okay. Jerry and I. Oh, fantastic. Yes. <laughs> We've collected a lot of stories. And once again, it will be a question of which story goes after which. And you know. Can I stop here? Sure. Huh? Here, this is open. You're open to questions. Right? Completely. Yeah. Completely. Are you going to write one about Ripley and the NCTA or Prithvi comes. Prithvi comes into this. And here, I would like to say that uh, an editor gets edited. When I did this book, it's a, it's a short history. Uh, it went to Oxford University Press because that was a publisher that I was familiar with. And Oxford University Press is like an elephant. It moves. <laughs> so here we were waiting for something to start happening. Nothing was happening. And uh, 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 one of the three people involved with this book, one is Sunil Shanbad, and the other is Ashok Kulkarni, who lives in Pune. And uh, Ashok uh, said to me, you know, Shanta, you realize, don't you, that all of us are past our cell by date. <laughs> and uh, you can't tell when it will happen. <laughs> so please ask these people to hurry up. So in fact, I wrote to them and said, we are all past 75 and likely to pop it in time. <laughs> Please hurry. <laughs> but of course, they couldn't because that's their system. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, this wonderful publisher, Speaking Tiger, had set up business. And uh, Jerry said, just take that to him. And I did so. And he made a wonderful suggestion. 
as far as OUP was concerned, they were quite happy with an oral history that ended at 1990. Uh, uh, speaking Tiger, Ravi Singh said, is there no more experiment theatre happening in Mumbai? In fact, I wanted to ask this Yeah. So I said, of course there is. So he says, please add 6,000 words at the end of the oral history, which gives us a picture of what is happening after the 90s. And that's where I wrote my postscript, which covered all, all the activities. And I chose Prithvi uh, because, you know, one of the things I've done in this book is to see the demographic shift from South Bombay, uh, Gulabai, to Central Bombay, Tardev, to Dadar, and then Prithvi. So it's a kind of northwards uh, shift of theater. That was one point. That it sort of made a good end to the story. The second point was that Dubey was everywhere. <laughs> So I had a human link as well. And the third thing was, in comparison with the NCPA, Prithvi was totally dedicated to theater. At the time when I was writing, uh, NCPA was renting itself out to fashion parades and christenings or things like that, whatever. But it had stopped being a th exclusively theater space. Yeah. Also, uh, Prithvi had what all these other places had. It had a personal warmth. NCPA was bureaucratic. So it did not fit my story at all. So these, uh, the postscript is entirely about Prithvi. Though I have said, and there's NCPA. Yeah. Apart from the play, are there any other spaces where these experimental projects are going on at present? Yes, yes, all over. In fact, what's happening now is even more interesting because people are now looking for all sorts of informal spaces. They're performing in bars. Yeah. They're performing in little clubs. They're performing, um, you know, the first kind of uh, foray out of a formal theater space was made by uh, Atul Kumar. Didn't he do uh, things in people's homes? He has started that. Yes. Then, yeah. yeah. Uh, in the 90s. Uh, 90s. You know, in the, in the he would uh, get uh, people who had a largish uh, drawing rooms and asked them to host a play. We did it in seven That, of course. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. But his question was about now. Yeah. Huh. Now, in the 90s. I have a question. Yeah. I'm familiar with filming. Yes. In film editing, sometimes it happens, the director has created a Ganesh, but after editing, the sound is missing and it becomes polished. Now, does such things also happen while editing in your kind of book? The actual essence is totally transformed into something else? No, it can't happen. With books, it can't happen because uh, uh, an author May I say that an author is probably more responsible than a filmmaker? <laughs> no. <laughs> if, <laughs> if, because right now, I think uh, just about a few days ago, a friend of mine said to me, uh, why do they no longer have a script? So. I said it's because they no longer shoot on raw stock. They shoot on videotape. And you can use as many 
as you want without feeling a pinch. So they just shoot. Uh, and if, if you have a script to begin with, it's sort of sitting on your neck and saying, why are you shooting this? That's not part of the script. So there is a certain kind of self-indulgence that's happening in filmmaking today, uh, where though whatever I may think about those filmmakers, I just can't visualize Ganpati turning into Bal Krishna. But if you say it happened, it happened. And the <laughs> editor, the only thing the editor can do is to NG that shot. Just leave it on the editing floor. Uh, I'll tell you, for this book, Amol Palekar filled four audio tapes. Four. Full. And what I have taken out of it, which was right for my purpose, is would fill about half an audio tape. How many pages have you come to? You have reduced Amul Palekar to how many pages? From? I think it could be about uh, three or four pages in all. But uh, he's like, uh, you know, anybody who's done that kind of work and has a camera before will naturally film for <laughs> which he did. But uh, that's what I mean, that uh, you have to be pretty brutal because you know what your book has to be. This is true of all artists. We used to talk to people like Billy Carl. Yes. Yes. You yes. 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 I know uh, this, but all artists don't do that. But I think there's also a positive thing to it, which uh, you may agree, that when you get so much, it's 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 better than not getting it. Yes, yes, that's true. you know. So As a second, I mean, if Karan speaks that much or Amul Palika speaks that much, yeah, uh, she may be able to. She has the material to choose from. It may be little, but not having something you cannot create. Yeah, it may, I agree with you. It makes editors' job not only challenging and very interesting. No, of course. You have it lots of material yes. or you get the best. Yes, yes. yes. If you, rather than getting a little zero. They don't have much of choice yeah, yeah. to do. Yeah. But then, if you should speak to big artists, then you will realize what she's talking about. She is a big artist. artist. I haven't talked to any big artists. So, she they have a lot of stories to tell. <laughs> 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 I have a question which might seem. Could you hold the mic? Could you hold the mic this way? Just towards your mouth? Yeah. You've been writing a weekly column, or more than that, in several years. So is Tanta Dobri, the writer, a very freewheeling, ad lib kind of nice, easy to read. Do you find yourself editing at any point, or it's not the editor? My the column, the uh, sub editor is not allowed to touch. <laughs> Do you edit it yourself? As you were yes, because I take a lot of trouble. Yes. It is not ad lib. Yeah. I read okay. up. I think. I do all these things and I read my column three times over before it goes. Do you edit it as you go along? Or At the, once the it's done, because it has to fit into seven, 750 words. That's, that's writer, my limit. That's the writer more than the editor? No, it's Both. editing because, uh, you know, to, to get what you want to say, into 750 words and not feel at the end that uh, there's a whole important point that you've left out it requires a lot of self-editing. It also requires a certain tautness of expression so that you can get a lot said in a little space. Yes. So it has to do a lot with self-editing. So yes. you write for anybody else in the past from that column for mirror? No, no, I have now reduced all the writing. Exactly. 
Can yes. I ask a question, yeah. please? Um, um, see, this oral history, mm. uh, now um, on one hand, I mean, I've read it, obviously, that's what I'm asking. Uh, on one hand, it does give very interesting, you know, a sweep, sweeping uh, idea of what was going on. But do you think that supposing it is uh, uh, can it be used as a text by theatre students? Or because when I read, I just felt, and you just said that, that people have said different things. So can it be taken as some authoritative book or that's not meant to be? No. Uh, no, it's not meant to be. Okay. Also, actually, um, I didn't know this, but uh, I was very much in fashion when I did it as an oral history. Because the trend now is not to write a single voice history. History is made by many people, and all their voices have to come in. Uh, people have start, stopped believing in the single voice because it means that there is a strong bias at work. Whatever you may say, an author has a viewpoint and will write to promote that viewpoint or will write out of that viewpoint. This is supposed to be the present trend. When I was doing it, I didn't know that I was so trendy. <laughs> but does it touch on English theatre also? Like yes, it starts with that because uh, it's not just Marathi, no, no, no. It's Hindi, Gujarati, English, and Marathi. And the Gulabai Desai space was entirely there, uh, the South Bombay space. It was Dubey who challenged them and said, I can write better, I can direct better than any of you. And he started Hindi theatre. There was no Hindi theatre there before that. Uh, you have been a critic of many plays in Mumbai. And also, you have interviewed directors. Now, what is it when you interview the directors? And when you see their plays, when you see their plays, their expression should come out through, through their plays. What they said, did it measure up to what they were saying through the plays, or was it totally different? Yeah. Um, which uh, um, I don't know. I'm trying to remember. Uh, I don't think uh, we interviewed uh, them as directors in this book. Um, I think most of the interviews are about uh, the, the, the kinds of plays that were being done. And some people spoke about the plays in which they were involved, which they felt was significant. There are some comments about how Ibrahim al Qazi directed. Some comments there. But uh, it, it, these are not interviews with directors as directors. Those are in the Dubai book. Lots of interviews of that sort. Not here. Here, as I said, we gave them very specific brief. This is what we want you to talk about. Do you have a question? Yes, uh, ma'am, I wanted to ask, typically, how much time did you take to edit each book on an average? And what is the process that you follow? Uh, you know, generally, how do you begin? I begin by sign. <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, jokes apart, it's, uh, it, it just depends. This, this uh, Midapani book, the collecting of the material itself took me about four years because uh, I, I wasn't funded. Uh, I can edit, I can write, but I can't write proposals to funders. I don't know how to get money. So I was doing this under my own steam. So it took that long. And then it came to a point where I felt I had all the material. And generally, um, from the point that I feel I have it all to the point uh, that I finish the book, 
it takes me just about two or three months because I'm, I'm like crazy. From morning till night, I'm working on it. I'm just completely lost to the world. So it happens very fast, two or three months. There's a question up there. Um, I was just uh, wondering. Use the mic if you don't yeah. mind, it'll help us record it. Oh, Hi. Um, sorry, I was just uh, wondering, uh, as an editor, when you've worked with writers, if you could tell us about a couple of bad habits that writers have, that any adv an advice you or recommendations you'd make to writers who are working with editors. What should you do to get the best work out of editors and be nicer and you know just <laughs> easier? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, um, okay. Uh, there was one contributor to the uh, Times of India arts page. Uh, she used to write about art as well as music. And uh, she had a, a style that uh, stopped you from understanding <laughs> what she was saying. You recognized all the words, but there was a problem with her syntax. Um, and. Uh, uh, her sentences would be convoluted, so uh, she uh, she would start with a subject, but not have a verb, stuff like that. Now, um, I have never wanted to kill a contributor's voice. Uh, it's important that there should be many kinds of voices in anything that I edit. So what I used to do was to call her to, to the office. Or when she came to submit, those were not times when we could send things on email. People had to actually bring the object to you in the office. So when she came, knowing her habits, I would say to her, give me 10 minutes. I'll read this while you sit and have chai. And then I would go line by line with her. This I understand as meaning this. Is this what you mean? And uh, she would still go into uh, that space <laughs> where she lived. <laughs> and uh, so it was a very painful thing to bring her down to a level where she spoke our language. <laughs> <laughs> but I got it from her. I didn't sit and it would have been very easy for me to, to just sit and correct the copy. But it was important for me to respect her as a voice and get her to correct her copy in front of me with the questions that I asked. So that was definitely one experience. What? The other is when people come to me as mentor, and uh, they want me to read a story and react to it. And uh, uh, now I have come to understand uh, uh, there are two kinds of writers. One kind comes to you, is actually open to what you want to say. And the other actor wants you to say, wow, what a story. <laughs> so uh, to, to those people, I don't quite go to the extent of saying, wow, but I say it's interesting. <laughs> and leave it at that. But to others, it is an absolute delight to go through a story and to see what the writer is trying to do, to get to the seed of the idea, and then to help the writer to see why that idea 
hasn't been fully expressed in the story that he or she has written. So working with a writer is, is uh, really very interesting. Is that an answer to your question? Yeah. It is. <laughs> You've been a nice editor. I try. <laughs> I mean, very often I'm saying, oh, it's that again. <laughs> and then I put on my nice face and say, you know. <laughs> Any further questions? But what a tragedy nowadays in English paper, at least, we don't see any art, there's no critique. Nothing. No, nothing, it nothing. Is, no. Yes, we can do a lot of advertisement. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. 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 Uh, what sort of a journey is better for an author who is starting off? Is it better to find an editor and then bounce ideas and then move the journey together? Or is it for someone to sort of put their thoughts and put it all on paper and then uh, find an editor and say, okay, so this is what I put down and how do you think I should go ahead? See, it, uh, uh, if, if you are starting out and you don't, uh, um, you're not totally confident as you shouldn't be if you're starting out, then it is always a good idea to show your manuscript to a few people for their reactions. I was uh, an, an, an experienced editor will then show you the way. Like uh, recently, I had someone uh, uh, who'd written a novel and wanted to know uh, how he could take it forward uh, because he wanted to be published. I read the novel. It was very racy. There was a story. There were characters. But there was no very serious intent, uh, no serious theme that was holding that story. It was just a story. So. I said, today in India, there are two kinds of publishers. One publisher, which will look at what has come to be known as literary fiction. And one kind, which does popular fiction. Mm -hmm. um, so I see your novel as falling into the second part. So these are the names of publishers to whom you can take this manuscript, and I think you will be accepted. So he felt a little put down. Mm -hmm. He said, you mean uh, by literary fiction, you mean Amitabh Ghosh? So I said, yes, definitely, <laughs> Amitabh Ghosh. So he said, uh, with this novel, I can't aspire to that. So I said, no, you can't. But you may later, depending on how you would <laughs> develop your ideas. He went to Rupa, and Rupa published it. So there is a very variegated market now for fiction. And you just have to know, or get someone's advice to know where to place what you have written. But if it is completely raw, <laughs> then you need an editor to help you before it goes to a publisher. Because publishers, editors, will only look at your manuscript once it is accepted for publication. I was reading um, uh, Ruskin Bond's autobiography, and he is one of the few authors who has actually published a letter that his editor wrote to him when he submitted his first manuscript. And this was when he was in London. And this lady uh, kept on shaping his novel for him. He did about three drafts of the novel. And she was still writing to him about Little Point. And he reproduces her letter in his 
autobiography in gratitude for what she did for him. Normally, you will find editors in the acknowledgement. Like, and I have to thank dot, dot, dot for the wonderful job of editing. But that wonderful job took months and months. But uh, he, he gives complete credit to his editor. There is something which I think as we end, I have to, I am uh, utterly charmed by this old story which happened in the 1990s when the French literary critics, theorists, uh, suddenly became all powerful. And uh, there were words like post-structuralism, post-modernism. You know, a whole lot of jargon uh, had come up. Uh, and it's still floating around. So uh, there was this uh, so cultural, a uh, very, very prestigious journal called Social Text. And uh, a mathematical, mathematical physician who was teaching in New York decided that he would like to send up the kind of stuff that was being published. So he wrote, his name is Alan Sokal. It's a famous Sokal affair, it's called. He wrote a rubbish article, complete rubbish, uh, using a lot of quotes from these big wigs of literary criticism. So all those quotes were there. And uh, in those days, of course, the idea was that uh, there's a uh, uh, everything is socially constructed. So science is rubbish. Uh, it's happening again now, apart from that. Um, so he, as an established scientist, was writing, rubbishing science. The editors were thrilled. Milgaya ek or. And they published this article. And once the article was out, he wrote an article saying, my article was nonsense. Wow. <laughs> Nothing that I wrote made sense. And these big three editors sitting there thought it was a sensible article. So there was a big <laughs> hullabaloo about it. So editors have to have knowledge. They have to be one step ahead of their contributors. Otherwise, they'll never catch out hoaxes of this kind. First of all, regarding my field, architecture, we used to have uh, critics, reviews on architectural work, which was very, very formative and it was a good feedback to the people who were doing it and we used to accept it positively. Mm -hmm. But there were some certain ethics that when you want to criticize, when you want to talk about someone's work, talk in front of him, especially in his presence. You know, these are the morals you can say. Or, uh, don't do it in public. That was accepted norms for uh, architects. And that's, the, that's the reason architects were not supposed to advertise their name and splash that I've done this, I've done this. But they were, uh, uh, they were allowed to let their work talk yeah. or let others talk about their work. Yeah. That, that was the restriction. Yeah. 
So, what with this change in scenario, when we don't have such critics anymore, reviews, architectural reviews, and all that. Yeah, I'm talking about my field. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what happens when the rubbish gets so much of publicity? Rubbish will always get publicity. That you can't stop it, even in the times when there were reviews, etc., that you're talking about. Rubbish was happening. People want rubbish. <laughs> they, people love to live in buildings which have uh, Rajasthani charokas or Grecian columns. Things that have nothing to do with our environment. But people love it. They feel that they're living in palaces. So it's an aspirational kind of thing. So you, that happened. But uh, in this kind of thing that you're saying, I, I will tell you that there there's a, a, was a very good friend of mine who wrote a play which I did not like. And I did not, in the question answer session, talk about it. I just kept quiet. He said to me, why didn't you speak? What did you think of it? I said, let's go for a drive. I'll tell you what I thought of it. We went for a drive. I told him. The next day, he wrote me a 10-page letter, which said, I thought you were a friend. You know, just now when you said that you did not say, uh, it just reminded me that uh, when one was doing experimental theater or any other thing, we used to say, uh, whether it was right or wrong, I cannot say not all these years, but uh, we must criticize each other. Of course we must. But if we do that too openly or publicly, there are people who are just waiting in, uh, you know, uh, to uh, pull us down. And the same about alternate films and all that. So uh, we must be very honest with each other, but we must always remember that there are there are about 80 percent more people who are, who really want to uh, tear you uh, to pieces, and they will misinterpret that you are trying to criticize yeah. each other to. Uh, becomes better or whatever that is, they won't and they say, see, this is what happens. This is rubbish and th this one is also saying that. So one had to be so yeah, yeah. careful of about, course. you know, that Absolutely. keeping that balance between, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, when he said and you said, I just remembered mm -hmm. all these I, I follow that principle mm -hmm. in my columns. Uh, if I see a production mm -hmm. and it's a new group that's trying to do something mm -hmm. and there are problems. I don't write about it. Mm -hmm. I, I don't want to publicly criticize something mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they're, they're, they're in their formative stage. Yes. And uh, they're trying to do something which others aren't risking. Yep. So right. one has to support that. But I do it by not writing about it. I <laughs> can't bring myself. And I hope they don't think so. You are thinking it's great or something. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> Do we have any further questions? Uh, well, question uh, somebody said about the newspapers not covering the arts. Since a little over a year, the Hindu Bombay edition, as we see in Mumbai, has a very good section devoted to the arts, theatre, cinema. Even looks at them. In, in, in Marathi, yes, in English, if you're reading English papers. I said English. No, in English. I heard you say that. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. the weekend, beginning with Friday, Saturday, Sunday, the Hindu in Mumbai oh. covers a lot. It's a paper that comes out of other cities, but since mm -hmm. over a year they are in Mumbai. Mm -hmm. Thank you for saying that because they are all addicted, you know. Want to no, I'm just pointing that out. They are addicted to that. They uh, so, uh, have a regular arts page yeah, yeah. over the weekend. Hands of India, so you get lost. Oh, so it says it's over a year in Mumbai. But Prabha, there is a difference. I don't know, but I have a feeling that the trend now is to do pre-publicity. There are, there are no critiques. People are sent to talk 
to the directors and it comes before the play comes on so that there is publicity for the play which is not what uh, oh, that's not but yeah. you know what's happening. That's not, what I mean. It's not. information, it's publicity, but it is not it's that. A shift to the arts. But yeah, yeah. Of the, course. The, the, so I'm going to, sorry, I'm, it's becoming a bit of a personal conversation. Yeah. So if there are any further questions, otherwise we can let those who want to go go and those who want to stay back and chat, chat, if you don't mind. Yeah. Yeah. Right? So, uh, Ishan, do you want to, are there yeah, any further so questions so about yeah. the session? Okay. So with that, I think we come to the end of our session. I would like to thank Shantaji for helping us. <laughs> thank you for helping us shape the idea of how we shape the story as an editor. <laughs> and uh, just a little bit updates about our upcoming Mumbai local sessions. On the 12th of November, we have acclaimed Humri singer Tanashri Pandit Rai at Bahadaji Lal Museum. And she's going to take us on a journey through ragas, so you must come and uh, listen to her. On 17th of November, we have uh, Odyssey exponent and writer Shubhada Varadkar at Kitab Khana. And she's going to talk about her own relationship with dance, so you must come again. <laughs> and on the 2nd of December, we have Professor Mahan MJ right here at MCube Library. He's a geometer and a topologist. And he's going to talk about nature's shapes and mathematics. So you must come for that. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you for coming.